So I'd actually like to read you a, um, I'd like to read you something, Sharon. Um, there's a there's a there's a physician. Um, he's a uh, in Islamic medicine um, called. He's one of my uh, favorite guys. Uh, he his name is uh, Abdul Latif Al Baghdadi, and he wrote a a, a, a small uh, tract uh, called the Book of Two Counsels, uh, and most of it is complaining. You're a Shanghai Lun person, so you might enjoy this. Most of it is complaining about the mistakes that other physicians make. Uh, and he's complaining at one point about a team of physicians who were making the specific mistake of purging um, a patient who was already weak. So his innate fire was weak. Um, and in the middle of all of this, he started praising one of his teachers. And he says the following. He says um, his great experience and his profound acquaintance with the secrets of the human constitution were such that he could discern imbalances as if he saw them with his own eyes, as if the body were a transparent glass which displays all that which lies behind it. He did not hesitate for one moment when making his diagnosis, did not make mistakes, and did not unnecessarily complicate prescriptions, and only sparingly employed complex remedies. Um... And part of the reason I wanted to read you that is we have we've had a conversation, we've had a couple of conversations um with herbalists, and a lot of them, each one of them has something really beautiful that we that we've really we've really learned from them. Um and from you, I think over the years, kind of following your work, this has been the thing that I found very, very, very cool. Um it's this kind of insistence that you have on really being able to look at somebody and to see what was happening in their body as clearly and as simply um, and as transparently as possible. I think you've done a lot of work with that. And I know that in the graduate mentorship program that you teach, you focus a lot on teaching that skill um, to other people and um, I'm a professional teacher and anybody who can teach anything, I'm very impressed with. Um, so the first thing that we want to talk to you about is really, uh, that is mm -hmm. diagnosis and the ability, the ability to see those things in the body clearly. But I think before we get to that, we need to know what it's like to not see the, the body clearly. Um, and so my first question is about the different ways in theory that it can go wrong uh, in the way that schools teach uh, Chinese medicine. Um, what are the things that can go wrong when we try to diagnose someone? Yeah, that's a really good question because, you know, in some ways I teach a diagnostic method, but in reality, the method is simply avoiding the pitfalls. And when you avoid the pitfalls, you're walking a clear, straight path. So really the method is recognizing all these temptations. They're really temptations along the path to diagnosis to try to figure something out before it reveals itself to you. Um, you know, so I think the main thing is that when the patient walks in the door, we're immediately starting to gather information from them, you know, just the way they walk, the way they talk, their complexion and posture. And then we gather more information through asking them lots of questions. We find out what their Western medical diagnosis is, what medications they're on, how they're responding. And then we look at their tongue, we feel pulses, we do abdominal diagnosis. So you just imagine this incredible um, plethora of information that we get. And that is very overwhelming, you know, to get all that information. And then what do we do with it is really a question. Like we, we learn how to gather this information. And then once we have it, how do we organize that? What do we do with that information? 
because ultimately we have to come down to maybe a, a six herb formula or an eight herb formula. Like how do we take all that information and bring it down to something that's so succinct and herb formula, you know, and we have to also have a diagnosis, a method, you know, that we can articulate that's very succinct taken from this mess of signs and symptoms and information. So I think that that is very overwhelming for practitioners to, to know what to do. And I know for myself, when I was in school, we were taught to gather all this information and then we were taught to come to a diagnosis. And what that involved was like completely unclear. You know, like take it and then then come to a diagnosis as if it was natural to come to a diagnosis. And, you know, okay. And, you know, so I noticed as a teacher, like, I don't know, I I really started teaching in honest and in like 1998, um, teaching Chinese medicine and I would have people do case studies and wow, what people would do with the information was all over the map, you know, just like, wow, it's incredible what people do and and um, emphasizing different aspects. And, you know, so it really made me ask the question, like, well, what do you do? What is a good thing to do? And, and you know, and there, there are so many ways that people diagnose, but I think that the masters of diagnosis are it's not so much um, figuring out what to do with the information, but it's figuring out what not to do with it, you know? And and so really there, if you imagine this information like as a pond full of little fishes, you know, jumping around, you know, they, they're grabbing the red herrings, you know? Like, oh, they have diabetes. How do I teach, how do I treat diabetes? I'll look up diabetes and and try to figure that out. And that's really a red herring, right? Like you're following something that's gonna take you on a path that will not get you to a quality treatment if you try to figure out how to treat diabetes. Or even like they have migraine headache, like what's a good formula for migraine headache? That's a red herring, right? Because migraine headache can come from so many different patterns. Um, and, and even we're also taught to like take a main complaint, like a migraine headache and go to a book, like the practice of Chinese medicine and look up headaches and there might be seven or eight potential patterns for headache. And so we're taught to look that up and then fit our patient into a category right? But often our patients fit into two or three categories, or they might have a migraine headache and heavy menst menstruation. So do I look up profuse menstruation and figure out how to treat that? What eight categories are there in the book? Or am I looking up migraine headache? Oh, and they're constipated too. Like, where do I go in the book? So, you know, we're taught to do something that is actually not functional in the clinic. It's not functional. So you kind of pick a symptom to focus on and ignore the rest of the pattern. So in other words, there are, there's these pitfalls. Um, and so really the what I strove to do and what I teach now is really recognizing those pitfalls and developing a kind of patience and clear seeing. So as you're looking at things, um, you, the, you know, the patient walks in, they have all these signs and symptoms and you're seeing them for what they are first and not trying to figure out what they mean, you know? And so, this kind of anxiety that people get, they wanna figure things out too fast before you really taken in the whole picture and seeing, seeing each sign and symptom for what it is rather than for what you think it means. 
Um, and so there's a lot that starts to reveal itself if you wait and let the sign or symptom just see it for what it is, you know, so go, go ahead. So a lot of this is, um, is things that I sort of, you know, you notice just as a layman, you notice just from looking at, you know, I don't know, uh, what's that uh well without mentioning any names i suppose like just from introductory text to chinese medicine right um mm -hmm. one thing that i think you haven't got i mean you know we're looking at like um focusing too much on a particular symptom or there's just too much information and so you can do it when there's a lot of information like that i suppose what you're saying is you can make any pattern you want because there's so much there so That's you right. can group the information in whatever way you want which is honestly the thing that this is the problem that I have. I'm like, you know, <clears throat> if your mind is flexible enough, you can you can take the same set of symptoms and make 16 different patterns out of them and then jumble those around and make 16 different other patterns, right? Um, right. One thing that I've that I, I, I've sort of noticed, and I don't know if you think this is also a problem, is, you know, uh, a person has digestive pro problems, spleen sheet deficiency, you know? Um, and that's, I don't know. that's the, the conclusion you jump to, right? Right. right. Before you know anything else. Yeah. Right. So if we um can you give us a sort of um an example of of that? Like just you know, even if it's some a patient that you've seen or a case study that you've read or a patient that you make up and just just walk us through that for a second. The patient comes in a list of signs and symptoms, just so people have like a concrete example of like this thing that we're talking about here, which is that that person could then have this or this or this, and that all of those are perfectly reasonable. Right, right. So yeah, we could take something like... um depression as a main complaint, okay? Somebody comes in and they say, I'm depressed. And um, you look at them and they seem emotionally kind of shut down. Maybe they have some, uh, you know, irregular stool. They're um, cold, maybe especially their hands and feet. And um, and so, you know, you might think um, like what I've seen in students is, oh, they're kind of deficient, so I'm going to give them guaypiwan, you know, because um, guaypiwan nourishes, it's heart, blood, and chi deficiency. They're depressed. I want to nourish their heart, right? Somebody else might come in and say, um, well, you know, they're kind of emotionally shut down. They've got cold hands and feet. I'm going to give them sunisan or maybe shui fuju yutong because it's, you know, um, uh, it's got sunisan in it to kind of open them up to relieve their depression. Depression is, you know, constraint. And so I'm going to open them up. And, you know, so then in actuality, it could be a kidney yang deficiency, you know, and where you need a foods of formula to bring back the warmth and light into the body and into the heart. Um, so, you know, you could make a story that, you know, they've got a pale complexion, that means blood deficiency, and their tongue is pale blood deficiency, you know, so you could make a story to justify guaypiwan. You could make a story to justify Sunisan, you know, um, and you could make a story to justify Sunitang, you know. So um, how do you actually determine what's going on? But that happens all the time. You know, somebody has dysmenorrhea and you think, okay, they've got blood stasis and there's not really an ex exploration into what what might be the cause of the blood stasis. And um, so, 
um, you know, it can be from such a variety of things. And how do you how do you scope that out? How do you scope it out in this case? What what's actually going on? So I uh, does that answer that question? Yeah, 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 yeah. I I wanted to jump in um, as well because um, um, because it we we've we've it's it's a very interesting way of putting it because I've been thinking. I mean, we've been thinking about these questions around diagnostics and and so on. And 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 here you're saying you know masters of diagnosis realize the the, the emphasis is is on what not to do uh on the the art in it the clinical expertise comes in grabbing these red herrings right and it's very interesting right and we're talking and now uh, we, we're talking again about making stories to justify which is in a sense following these different will-o'-the-wisps sort of you know you know uh, uh, um reaching desperately there's an air of desperation about it um, and you and but we want something that is functional, as you say. Taught, we want something that is that can be functional in a clinical setting. So, um, what needs to be done then, in theory, to combat this tendency to um, to to fall into these pitfalls, to to sort of um, not avoid them, to keep stumbling into one pit after another, um, and um, what so I mean in terms of tools, in terms of a theory, in terms of a, a, an approach that is functional, if you could say a little bit about that, that'd be yeah, just the ticket. Yeah. yeah, so we sort of defined the problem, and then then what do you do? And um, and I I think it actually takes mind training, you know, to really watch your own mind as a practitioner and to see how you are maybe jumping to conclusions and creating a story and um, and to just slow slow down. Then I think, you know, I mentioned just seeing seeing signs and symptoms for what they are and not and not jumping to a conclusion about what they mean. So for example, if somebody has a, a pale tongue, what are you what are you seeing like one of my sayings is symptoms are not always what they seem but they're always what they are <laughs> you know they are always what they are so if somebody has a pale tongue you know you see that and you there's like wow there's not blood coming to the tongue like that's what you know right and then you 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 leave that like i wonder why i wonder why and you let that be you don't jump to a conclusion like it must be blood deficiency. And so one thing we we look at it, like we we actually train, we go through symptoms and say, what does this sign or symptom tell me for sure? And we practice. And so if you practice like, well, what does a pale tongue tell you for sure? And then you think of all the things it could mean, you know, like, well, it could mean blood deficiency. It could mean young deficiency. It could mean chi deficiency. And so among all those things that it's possible, what's the common denominator? And it's deficiency. So if you see a pale tongue, you know there's some deficiency. And that's all you know. And then the exploration continues. Deficiency what? You know, what kind of deficiency? And so... Then as we um, ask questions, so one thing we do in the program is also, um, what are the signs and symptoms that actually tell us that it is, that there is spleen chi deficiency? And there are some signs and symptoms that tell you for sure that there is spleen chi deficiency. And there's really not that many. Um, there are lots of symptoms that in books will be listed as signs of spleen chi deficiency that can very readily be from something else. You know, so if you look at a book that says, you'll have pale tongue and um, loose stool, you know, poor appetite, 
those things can come from something else. All those things can come from something else. So what are the things that tell you, oh, I know there's spleen sheet deficiency. And the list is actually pretty small. And it's for me, if I see um, scallops on the edge of the tongue, I consider that, a, that for sure the spleen is deficient. If the flesh in general is weak, like you feel the flesh part of the body and it's saggy and soft and lacks resilience, um, and it's in general in the body, not just the lower body, that is spleen chi deficiency. A lax abdomen where the flesh in the abdomen is very soggy and soft. And that's spleen chi deficiency. Weakness of all four limbs, you know, is, is spleen deficiency. And also, um, it's called epigastric hardness, but what it is is really tense muscles in the epigastric area is spleen chi deficiency. So that's about it, you know? So, you know, if you have spleen chi deficiency and it's causing the loose stool, you have to see it in these ways that are, that really tell you spleen chi deficiency. So for example, if you have somebody, they're robust, they don't have any deficiency signs, um, and they have a tendency to lose stool, and you do your diagnosis, and everything is wood constraint. You know, wood is constrained, and it's not efficiency wood, it's excess wood, you know. Then, for sure, you can explain loose stool with wood constraint that's affecting the earth, but it's not an earth deficiency problem. So I hope you see what I mean and how much more effective your formula can be. Like I, in that, I, you can have loose stool and even fatigue and, um, you know, a poor appetite. And it's all Xiaoyang, you know, it's all wood constraint. And that can explain loose stool for appetite and fatigue. And when you open things up and get them moving and the wood is no longer constraining the earth, the symptoms get better, but very different treatments, right? So, um, so we look at, we go through each of the, um, Dung and Fu and and ask like how would I know for sure if there's kidney deficiency? What would tell me for sure? Because there are lots of conclusions we jump to. Someone has hot flashes, they have kidney indeficiency. That's not true. You know, like you can have hot flashes for so many different reasons. And so, you know, instead, what is a hot flash? It's some heat flushing up in the body. That's what it is, right? So we look at what it is, and then we see what do I see going on in the body that could help explain it, you know? And maybe there's kidney indeficiency, but maybe it's kidney yang deficiency. Maybe it's even a Bai Hutong type of pattern, a white tiger decoction, you know? So, um, I, I hope I give that, give a clear idea. So we go through each of the zong and say, what would tell me for sure it's kidney deficiency and what kinds of signs and symptoms have I been taught that are red herrings? And we learn to recognize those like hot flashes, you know, or low libido, um, infertility, you know, kidney, kidney, we, we sort of learn to easily jump to those conclusions. So we practice not jumping to those conclusions by, you know, do, doing exercises with, with symptoms and also by doing case reviews, you know, where we, the students will write cases and inevitably jump to some conclusions. And so we sort of clear that up um, as we go along. So pause, and then they pause. develop those skills. 
I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sharon. So it's I want to stop you here for a second before we continue. What is the criteria then that you use for deciding here are the symptoms that we know for sure? That tongue example was incredibly clear to me. I don't know how Yasin is doing, but I just found it very, very clear. The yeah. speech deficiency one for me requires a little bit more of an explanation. Why this symptom and not that symptom? Yeah, so what I did many years ago is I went through all the available books in English and I looked like, you know, this one says spleen chi deficiency has all these signs and symptoms and this one has all of those. And I looked at everything and then I was like, which shows up in spleen chi deficiency and it doesn't show up anywhere else you know so you know that so something like loose stool well that shows up in other places you know and so loose stool is thrown out pale tongue is thrown out you know um and so what are ones that are only and it's repeated in every book these are only there and then that got refined over time, just based on experience, you know, just really like thinking it through. So, you know, um, something like low back pain, you know, is something that often shows up in kidney and, um, and maybe not in other pathologies. However, it, it, it gets thrown out of kidney because low back pain can come from a lot of different things that don't involve the kidneys at all. And so, but but for kidney, if you have low back weakness, pain that has a weak feeling, that's kidney. You know, so so kind of refining how we ask the questions and you know, really um refining it to actually low back and it's actually weakness in the lower body, you know, um chronic weakness in the lower body is for sure kidney. So um so yeah, I just did a lot of work, like looking at all these books and seeing what are the um, the main thing. And yeah. Well, I, that's actually, I mean, first of all, <laughs> that's a lot of work. Um, and second of all, I think there's at least two things that you've said. One of, well, three things. One is in theory, like from the books, what are the you're kind of triangulating you know so you're like this appears here and it appears here and it appears here but this only appears here and so we're going to keep that and ditch the rest and that's a theoretical thing but then you know you might get to the clinic and find that the books were wrong or something right but yeah, then, how does it really work how does it right. really work in the clinic and so the second thing is seems to be the experience of then refining some of those ideas through the clinical work and then, mm -hmm. but putting that down systematically so that can be transferred. Mm -hmm. But then the first thing that you said was actually none of those. The first thing that you said was kind of a epistemological humility thing, right? Like you look at the tongue and then you're like, there's some things that this tongue is telling me that cannot possibly be explained any other way. And then there are things that this tongue is telling me that can be explained in a lot of different ways. And it would be it would be just kind of foolish to to reach certain to overextend myself with the conclusions that I'm reaching. Yes. Yes. Okay. So two of those <laughs> things go on. Go ahead. So two of those things are things that have to do with just a lot of uh, grind work, right? Like you just what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And one of them seems to be a sort of principle that you can really just apply to any learning, right? Like, what have you learned versus what have do you think you've learned, right? Right. right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's a wonderful thing. I think that's, I mean, that's like, um, I mean, a conversation that I have uh, with people sometimes is there's a lot of, I feel, uh, knowledge that people have gathered over millennia of just really trial and error almost. 
that has gotten thrown out somewhere around the like 17th to the 20th century, right? Like there's like a kind of historical shift that happens to everything, medicine included. And uh, it's a little bit depressing to lose all that knowledge because a lot of people worked really hard for that knowledge, right? And I think yeah. it probably looked a lot like what you've been trying to do in how long have you been practicing? 40 years at this point, I think. Yeah. So it's nice that there's a way for that, that that's, there's a way to kind of transfer that knowledge. Here, I guess, then is my next question going from there. Are the concepts from before that period, I mean, with Chinese medicine, I suppose there's that kind of, um, there's that kind of Mao period, right? And things start to change a little bit about how the medicine itself is perceived, right? And mm -hmm. if you go before that, and if you go all the way back to the classics, then things are perceived slightly differently. And a lot of that groundwork was done with those concepts, refining them and all that stuff back then. How has, what are the concepts from that kind of buildup of knowledge from the classics? Which of those concepts help you with this idea of trying to come to a diagnosis that sees what's actually going on in the body as opposed yeah. to what your fancies are telling you or what your, what the patterns that you're sort of whimsical patterns that you're making are. Yes. Yes. So, you know, the, the Tao Te Ching says we have to, you know, trace back the manifestations to find the mother. Right. And so when a patient comes into the clinic, all we have to go on are the signs and symptoms, right? You know, all this information, that's what we have to go on. And so we have to find the diagnosis by tracing back. And that's what we're talking about is a method for tracing back the manifestations. But the the idea of like, well, what's the mother? Because, you know, we might be able to see there's some spleen chi deficiency, there's some wood constraint, kidney deficiency, systemic blood stasis. You know, we can learn how to see all of that, some yang rising, but then um we have a diagnosis that's got all these pieces and it doesn't necessarily lend itself to um at that point this kind of raw material doesn't lend itself to finding a formula right it's all these blocks of information and so there's another step which i think speaks to your question about the classics and um, and especially the yin yang theory that is completely what the Huang Di Nei Jing is about, and in my opinion, the Shang Han Zabing Lun as well. And you know, just in over and over and over again, there's the yin yang symbol, and we're directed to face south by Qi Bo, so that on the left is the east and on the right is the west and in front of me is the south and so we start to see the yang rising in the east and going down in the west and rooting in the north and so then we take our diagnosis and this is what we do in my program and we superimpose it onto the yin yang symbol so you know, we we look at where in the yin yang symbol, you know, so for example, blood deficiency. The um, blood deficiency is related to wood and deficiency wood, right? Not excess wood, but deficiency wood. Where is that located? Well, that is located in the east because that's where the wood is. That's where the zhui yin is moving up. And so we put the blood deficiency over there. You know, we have spleen deficiency. It goes right in the middle, and because the earth is in the middle, um, and then maybe there's some fire going up in the east because of the deficiency, or maybe if the, everything goes down in the west, and so blockage in the in the young Ming, blockage in the digestion, is. Um, a blockage in the um, descent in the West. And excess constraint is also a blockage in the West. And so we place things there and then we, we look at how life is supposed to happen. Like 
it's supposed to be young coming down from heaven coming all the way down and rooting and then being born again up in the east and this should be a constant cycle in our body so we start to see where is yin yang not happening and we're also weighing some things out some things might be very minor so we make them small you know, like they have a little bit of spleen chi deficiency, but overall, they're re it's a really excess pattern. You know, how do we um, weigh things out? And so we'll we'll visualize that in the yin yang symbol. And this actually just comes from, um, you know, my reading of the classics, but also just how I see my patients. You know, wow, how are things coming in? How are they getting blocked? Is it pivoting? You know, is it able to go back up and out again? Is there enough of everything? You know, so I'm seeing my patient in terms of yin yang all the time. So we also train to then put our, we call it the diagnosis in five, you know, like zong fu diagnosis, like based on the wuxing, the five phases. The diagnosis in five is still very materialistic and not very energetic quite yet, right? They have this, they have this, they have this. But then when we put it in the yin yang symbol, which is described in depth in the Huang Di Nei Jing, then we start to see the what it is we need to do to restore the movement of yin yang in the body. And, and really you start to be able to see the herbs that you're going to use, you know? So if there's a lot of excess wood constraint, meaning that that pivot is blocked, oh, I'm gonna be using Chai Hu, Huang Qin. If it's really hot, I might use Lung Dan Cao, you know, and, and really the formula starts to reveal itself. You know, what is it I wanna do in this person? When you start to see, you know, you've, you've clarified it, you're, you're not being run around by lots of symptoms leading you in wrong directions. You've clarified it. This is what's actually going on. Now, how do I see it in yin yang? And the herbs start to say, you're going to use me, you know? And so you'll see dangwe sunitong or, you know, the formulas start to compose themselves. So so there's two there's two things. Uh, this is fascinating. I mean, on the one hand, it, it actually, I was going to say that it sounds like you're... Um, just kind of constructing something, but it's actually interesting because it it almost sounds like you're it almost sounds like you're you're kind of dismantling a sort of uh how things look now and then taking them back to the classics and reconstructing something, you know, like it's almost like the places where you said you would put those things is where those things actually belong in Chinese medicine originally. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there's a really strong emphasis on dynamic movement because we're we're always being created, right? Like, you know, our bodies are, it's not like here I am and this is me. Like I am constantly coming into form and dissipating my form all the time. Right, and that's because we're receiving influences from heaven that are recreating us and then we're expressing them back out again. You know, so there's forming and, and disillusion happening all the time and it's, it's moving, that's moving. And so when we apply herbs, we're looking at what's going wrong with the movement? Where is it moving too fast, dissipating too much, leaking out? Where is it moving too slow and getting blocked? So we're working with these heavenly and earthly energetics to, to have the whole movement happen smoothly and beautifully. So we're not just tonifying the spleen, right? In a body that's inside an envelope and we're gonna strengthen the spleen. We're promoting the natural movement and. This is where it kind of comes to farming too. My my daughter, we were just talking about it at Passover. Um, and she was she was talking about sort of this setting things in motion with the seeds, 
you know, like planting a seed and, and that kind of yin yang balance of setting something. And then like, what is the motion? The motion is it's filled with all this potential, right? And then the influences come from nature. And then this, this magic happens, right? And so as a farmer, your job is actually kind of simple. You're just setting things so that the natural motions do the healing. You know, so we're not we're not actually just tonifying the spleen. We're we're setting things up so that the natural tonification comes. You know, so it's seeing everything in terms of motions, these motions and influences that come from our environment. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um Actually, Yasin has, a, I, I have a question, but I think there's a question that Yasin has been dying to ask, and I think this is a good time for him to ask you that. Yeah, I, I've, I've been messaging him frantically. Let me, let me <laughs> ask it, let me ask it. Um, so, and, and really the farming thing now, that's, that's fascinating because I, 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 want, I wanted to get at the relationship. So we've been talking about the great sweeping motion, as, which is, I've seen you call it in, in some yes. of your lectures. Yes. Um, and the my question gets at, and now with the farming uh, uh, um, analogy, it gets even more interesting because I, I can think of how it relates to farming. So we're talking. There's a motion in nature. There's a motion inside a body, and at some and and there's a uh, there's something and, and but these two motions are related. They 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 there's an interaction between them. Uh, um, um but and if i'm understanding correctly and the motion within the body mirrors to a certain extent the the motion within nature um um i have read in several texts and i find it fascinating because i've got this fascination with all things martial from martial arts to other things that that often the use of the battle metaphor for in terms of either how um, uh, a, a Chinese medical practitioner should approach, you know, um, uh, the the, um, a, the treatment of a particular patient, right? You know, it's it's it, 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 in, in 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 a sense of not just looking at what the opposing army is doing, but you know, taking account of the weather patterns, the terrain. Right. How am I going to, you know, this I could meet this army on a on any other day. But on this particular day, there are certain things that make it so that I have to sort of approach, um, you know, it's raining today or something. So, I, you know, it, it changes my tactics. Um, and then you mentioned the farming thing and I'm, and, you know, and you're talking about aiding and all of a sudden I'm thinking pesticides and I'm thinking, you know, what's happening these days in terms of trying to stifle things or stop it and that's you know battle on another nature you know there's the there's the battle in terms of like how should I treat the patient and view what's happening inside the body and then there's the battle of which is I guess with the farming thing is talking about just stopping certain you know movements full stop right we there's the you know I, I'm just going to go in there and cauterize something so it stops um, I think there's a there's a battle metaphor that is that's um you know there's the kind of like uh yin and wei sort of like idea right like there's 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 your wei chi which is kind of like the 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 battlements and the soldiers at the front and they're trying to keep something out right um and actually i've i think i've heard you sharon you kind of don't like that idea you sort of you <laughs> like the idea you like the idea of there being a sort of interaction between the inside and the outside. And I think what both of us are find kind of interesting is why you like why you like the idea of communicating more than the idea of battle, like as an mm -hmm. analogy, you know, or why you like the nature analogy and not the battle analogy. Yeah, um, I, I think it's a very deep question. Um, and, you know, I think it really has to do just what, what kind of relationship do we want with 
the rest of the world in general? You know, what kind of relationship do we want? And, you know, I, I think I'm Buddhist as well as Jewish, but, you know, and I think the, the idea that we're all interconnected, you know, so that that person is actually me on a very profound level. And the battle metaphor is, is that there's me and then there's other things that might attack me that I have to protect myself from, right? And, you know, and it's not that that's not real, but it's a narrative about reality that that ends up creating certain actions that we might take, right? Of, of attacking things outside of me or building walls so that things don't get at me. And, um, you know, so is that the narrative that's gonna work the best for me in general in my life, you know? So, um, you know, thinking about enemies that I might have, you know, how how is it that whatever's happening outside of me is actually something that I need to learn how to um, let in and integrate so that I can end up having a better relationship with those things that are outside of me. So in terms of medicine, if we think about the influences coming from heaven, they're, all, they're coming into me that on every level, our bodies are completely permeable, right? And in order, we're constantly taking in things from the outside. And we have to, in order to be healthy, we have to take things in and be able to process things and turn them into life right and and so if we have a general attitude of there's all these things outside of me that can hurt me and i have to protect myself from that then we run a risk of of really damaging our health and this is because we're psychically building walls and this is really obvious when people have like food sensitivities and they find like, if I stop eating wheat or something, wow, I feel so much better, you know, when I stop eating wheat. But then after a while, they don't feel so good anymore. And then they think, what is it now? And okay, it's corn or it's dairy or whatever. And your, you, your relationship with the outside world grows smaller and smaller. And you've never learned, your, you've never let your body learn how to process. And so in Chinese medicine, you know, what we might do instead is if somebody has bloating and distension that's worse when they eat wheat, then we try to increase your ability to process wheat well, you know, and and so that you can be comfortable eating wheat. So with my patients, we try to re I mean, unless you have celiac disease or something where we will kill you, you know, um, you know, but just sensitivities, we try to um, increase the body's ability to process life. And, and actually the, the way chi, you know, you maybe you've heard me talk about it. It is actually this yang that's inside the ying, you know, it, it has to be inside the ying so that we have this really nice ozone layer of protection, but it also breathes. You know, those, your pores have to open and close. It breathes. And so we're, we're still taking things out and, and it really has to do with our ability to, um, not just protect ourselves, but to actually feel protected on the inside. So we're not so afraid of the outside world, you know? So a formula like wager tongue, it actually increases your capacity to um, handle the outside world, like if you're super sensitive emotionally and everything gets at you and you feel like you have to over defend yourself, that's a yin way disharmony. And when you harmonize the yin and way, then you feel protected. So you don't have to be so prickly. 
Um, I just feel like I talked about a lot of things all at once, but I'm, I'm going to have to restrain myself because every sentence that you say opens up like an entire topic of discussion for me. And so I think it's probably just best if I in invite you and your family over to dinner at one point. Um, <laughs> Uh, what I will say, though, because I find this absolutely fascinating, is before I started um, choosing Chinese medicine as a form of treatment, I went to a, a naturopath. Uh, I knew nothing about Chinese medicine. I knew I, if you told me surface opening, I would have no idea what you were talking about. And I remember a complaint that I made to her. I told her when I was when I was well, I felt like my 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 skin was breathing. And those were literally my words. It really was a sensation that you're selectively permeable to the to the to the outside environment, and that there was something that expanded and contracted with your breath. Um, and she gave me a funny look, and so we just moved on. But that's one of those things that really fascinates me about Chinese medicine. For that reason, is because I felt it before I knew anything about what any of those words meant. Um, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to do an annoying thing because this is this is a thing that we that I think uh, you and I both dislike. I'm going to ask you about it anyway, because I think it will reveal some things and it's on this topic. What about, though, this I, this kind of because you talked about we have to process these things from the outside, we have to bring them in and then we have to somehow uh, communicate with them in our bodies. Right. In a second, I'm going to ask you, what are those things? But right now, I want to stay on the sort of negative part of this and say, isn't there a conception of the classics and of the Shang Han Lun in particular that's floating around that the confirmations, for example, that you have like, you know, cold lodged in a particular place in your body, right? What is wrong with that idea? Like, why don't we just go with that? Why don't we just say, yeah, yeah, it's like these layers of like defense and you're trying to keep these things out and the, the pathogen gets stuck in this part of your body and like, why, wouldn't that work? Um, to a certain extent, it, it would work, yes. Um, and, um, but from a classical point of view, the six chi, like wind and damp and cold and heat and fire, they are um, uh, physiological. They're, those are the, the building blocks of life. We're made up of the six chi. And, and what, where does pathology come from is when um, those six chi don't move properly in our bodies. And so you can say, I mean, this has happened so many times. Like, let's say you have pneumonia and you definitely diagnose you have heat in your lungs, right? So then what do you want to do? You want to get that hot pathogen out of the lungs from a TCM point of view. That's what you want to do. From my understanding of the classical point of view the heat that's in your lungs is actually your life force that's stopped moving. It's not a pathogen that came in from the outside. It's your life force got blocked and is building up in your chest. And then the question is, what is it that got blocked? You know, and that could be like on the, um, the Yang Ming, Great sweeping motion has various stations. It could be like a Shurgao kind of block, like a Bai Hutong kind of block, but it could be a Huang Lian type of block, which is more epigastric. It could be a pivot block, like a Chai Hu Huang Qin type of block. It could also even be like a lack of cool fluids coming up to the lungs, you know? And so when you have that perspective, you start to look at it differently and I think much more effectively. Like for example, um, I remember treating a guy, he actually came in with his wife. I was treating his wife for fertility and he was in the waiting room, big guy, he was a, a, an athlete and he 
um, he had pneumonia and it, he was like exhausted. And he's like, I've got this walking pneumonia. I can't get rid of it. And I looked at him and, and I took his pulses, but just looking at him, he was, he had this big belly and I felt his abdomen under his rib side and his belly was so, um, full. And then with his pulses, I knew that, that it was Da Chai Hutong, like his Yang Ming and Xiao Yang were blocked. So I gave him Da Chai Hutong while I went in with his wife. And by the time we came out, he was feeling so much better. And so the view was what's not moving the way that it should. And this was like something not moving down in the West. And the signs and symptoms just pointed me right to it. The pneumonia was a red herring, right? Like, how do you treat pneumonia? Oh, it's heat in the lungs. That's a red herring to me that blocks you from being able to see the pattern. And so now pneumonia could be a whole variety of different patterns, but that was that pattern. And so then once you get it moving, the lungs are relieved. And so the he didn't have pneumonia, right? He had a da chai hutong pattern that was making him not be able to resolve his lungs. Um, so I that there's just that example. That's um, a, that's that. actually that's an that, that's a really amazing example. Um, it's it's and so where do where do external evils come in? You know, I mean, the idea that the Shanghua Mun is about things coming in from the outside, going deeper, 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 and Zhui Yin is the deepest is nuts to me, because <laughs> nothing in Chinese medicine is linear. It just doesn't work that way. And once you see that actually, you know, Zhui Yin is the completion of the circle, and it has to do with this upward movement moving back up to tai, Taiyang, it's so obvious. And all the the formulas just make so much sense then when you start to see in that perspective. And so the pathogen is always treated by restoring the proper movement in the body. And that naturally resolves the pathogen. So yeah. it's interesting. It, it reminds me a little bit of the um the beginner sort of uh, Islamic Islamic medicine. Um you know the little the little primer we do things in poems um and you know it's like the diseases have two levels the specific and the general you can have a um general disease without a specific disease uh but you can't have a specific disease without a general disease i think that's what it oh, was that's really a beautiful way of saying it but it's an interesting yeah. thing because the pneumonia would be the specific disease but that yang ming thing would be the general disease and if you and it's a it's a fundamental imbalance of the temperament like in and the you body. you had it before you had the pneumonia right that's it was right. there that's before the pneumonia right and... otherwise you would not have pneumonia that's the idea exactly you yeah. might have gotten a cold, but it would have passed through easily. <clears throat> yeah. And really, for me, like the symptoms that show up, even with something like COVID, um, the symptoms that show up are telling you which confirmation needs help so that you can process this thing, you know? And so the symptoms aren't exactly the COVID symptoms. You know, I think that the pathogens that come in, like, COVID or Ebola or flu, they come in and those, those bugs, they mess with our confirmations, but we also come with our, the problems we have with our confirmations before that pathogen came in. And so um, when we help, the, it doesn't really matter whether the pathogen disrupted the movement of our confirmations or whether we had that before, the symptoms show us what needs help in terms of the movement of the confirmations. You know, so there is no COVID treatment. You know, there's no Lyme disease treatment. There's only looking at what's going on with that patient and where do they need help. And I think it is also what helps us create immunity. Like, um, actually, just yesterday, I got my first... Uh, 
tick bite. Um, I was out horseback riding and there was a tick. And I'm immune to Lyme disease because I've been bitten by so many ticks. And the symptoms I always work with as a manifestation of where my confirmations need help. And so now my body really knows how to process the poison that the ticks bring. You know, so that's how we create immunity is by helping our patients process things, you know, if that makes sense. That's that's really very beautiful. And I've been I've been really angry at the uh, at the uh, government's lack of addressing like Lyme on the East Coast. You know, I live in a very rural community when I'm in the States. And they're just not paying attention to it, but that's a whole other story. But that's a wonderful way to, like, I think, get um, help. Um, I'm hearing a couple of things uh, about, you know, uh, about diagnosis, right? About how these classical Chinese ideas help you understand the body in this way. Um, and I've heard you talk about this before. You know, you've had yin yang, which is two things you know, and you've got the wuxing, so we've got five things, and then we've got the confirmations, which are six things, and you're also doing this interesting thing where you're saying there's a kind of material level, and then it becomes more and more almost uh, subtle or functional or uh, less material or less visible or less whatever as we go down, right. that, down that path. Um, but more, more specific. It gets more where you can come down to an herbal formula. In, you know, from all direction. the miasma of signs and symptoms, it starts to be that invisible realm starts to, that's what you're treating. And that's what gives you the herbal formula, you know, that. So that's a good place now for Yassine to ask you the question that I've been keeping him from asking rudely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I, I just I wanted to go into because we've we've touched now on the confirmation several times and um, the movement of these confirmations and we've spoke uh, you know um, very interestingly about the relationship of these movements to um, disease and so on. Could you give us um, could you could you perhaps um, tell us how these confirmations work or how how um how you see their movement uh and um if we could start with that and then perhaps um uh and then how does that help us by understanding how these how the confirmations work you said something very interesting that is there's nothing linear about it um rather it's it's a set of movements how does that understanding help in terms of diagnosis um and understanding signs and symptoms so yeah mm, yeah so you know seeing the signs and symptoms for what they are and understanding which signs and symptoms tell you for sure that a particular organ or or pathology is happening you know that that kind of simplifies it down so now you're able to articulate the spleen, the blood, the dampness, whatever. Um, you're able to articulate and say, now I see what's going on. And then putting it in the yin yang symbol is what gives you the great sweeping motions. And I know we're going to be talking about the pivot concept soon. And so I think that'll give you um, more of a of a sense. But if we're going around the yin yang symbol, each confirmation is a movement uh, within the yin yang symbol. Each confirmation is a movement. So once you see that basic movement, you can then go back to symptoms that, like something like insomnia. You you know by itself, if somebody we we sort of do this exercise, like somebody calls you up on the phone and says. I have insomnia and then you get disconnected. And now it's like, oh, so what do I know for sure? <laughs> the only thing I know is they have insomnia. And really with insomnia, all you know is how oh, the young is not stay, it's not rooting at night. That's all you know. And you don't know why. Is it because it can't get down? Is it because it goes up too fast in the morning? You know, um, you don't know 
why until you start to flesh it out. So once you have the diagnosis in yin yang, then you bring back those symptoms like, now how do I understand the insomnia? I have and a- now I, have... I, I see the whole pattern. Can I explain why they have hair loss? Why they have insomnia? Why their stool is loose? Why, you know, you start to be able to go back. And so we have a, a stage where we go back and see, how do we explain the symptoms that really didn't tell us much of anything now that we have a diagnosis? And and that is very natural for me in the clinic, like, just like, oh, I see the pattern. And for me, that happens pretty quickly. Like, it, you know, I ask questions and the pattern just sort of reveals itself. It's actually a much simpler method than any TCM method. You know, it, it just, once you get used to it, you start to see things very quickly. Kind of like that quote that you read in the beginning, like you just start to know, I see it, there it is. And then you can see why they have diabetes or why they have hypertension be based on the pattern. So you go back to those symptoms and see, can I make sense of them now? You know, so it's, it's an interesting thing because it, it this is a thing that I've noticed I think in other fields, right? That you, um, the relationship maybe I'm trying because I'm trying to wrap my head around um, why that works that way, and it, I guess one possibility, but this is really a question that I'm asking you is. When you say the pattern, it's really the relationships between symptoms that somehow they show you the overall picture. You know, I'm like, I'm trying to think, for example, you know, heat above, cold below. Each individual symptom is not going to tell you anything, but the kind of the tendency for the ability to um, perceive the, the, the grouping that's actually physically happening in the body is mm -hmm. going to um, is easier than trying to take each individual symptom and then see if you can if you yourself can put it together in a in a that's that's, that's why I talk about it it reveals itself yeah you should have that sense like oh I see now everything falls into place mm -hmm. because it's it's revealed itself because you're not adding theory onto it you're seeing it for what it is not for what you think it means you know and you can create a, a story about it and so let me try to let me ask you a, a, a specific thing this will be our second to last question but one thing that really helped me coming into this classical thing uh we did not go to school for any of this stuff right so mm -hmm. so checking out the TCM thing was it took like a while to wrap your head around like what is a liver they're obviously not talking oh they're not talking about an organ they're talking about a whole thing then you're done with that and you're like uh something about this does not make sense to me so you go to the classical Chinese medicine thing and now they're like confirmations and you're like dear god where does this end like how many of these ideas do I have to wrap my head around I'm getting old okay one of the things that actually really helped me understand the idea of a confirmation, and I was talking to Yasin about this before we started, was um, hearing you talking about the idea of opening through um, and the Yang Ming. And I think why that helped, I've been thinking about why that helped. And I think that the reason it helped is because with the Yang Ming thing, at least for me, there's a, there's a, it has a very gross quality. It has like a, it has a concrete quality. There's food. It goes into the stomach. Right? Something is happening. And I can almost watch like that process from my mouth and out the other side. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just spend a, just a minute? Because I heard you at one point then talk about constipation. And you can do constipation and say Yang Ming. But then you can do constipation and do a bunch of other stuff. I would can we take a minute and just use the Yang Ming confirmation and that idea of opening through and the and the and the clinical problem of constipation to sort of explain this business about patterns and how yeah. like seeing all that pattern like come together? Right. And so, you know, somebody calls and they said, I have constipation, and then you get disconnected. What do you know for sure? with constipation 
what what do you know not much like, you know that they're not going to the bathroom yeah they have some stuckness where in their large intestine right and that's all you know and so one thing i train my students to not do is to jump from symptoms to a confirmation or a confirmation is another way of saying the great sweeping motion right so we can't say constipation equals yang ming right we we know that the that in five in zangfu there's some stuckness in the large intestine but until we get the rest of the picture we don't know if there's actually a problem with the yang ming or just the yang ming is being affected by something else just like we talked about wood constraint could cause loose stool the spleen isn't deficient but it's being affected by wood constraint so the same thing is that the the young men can be affected even by like um spleen damp can cause constipation you know and so that's actually very common and we talk about the use of baiju the tracta lotus for constipation and it's it's incredibly useful um but so you know you then you see oh their spleen is so deficient they have all this dampness and they're constipated you know so how do i explain the constipation with actually the confirmation that comes out is the tie in confirmation so then how do i explain the cons constipation well, dampness causes all this stagnation. Fluids don't move. They don't go where they're supposed to go. It it they they stagnate things. So I can see how oh it could stagnate the large intestine too, you know. And so then it's it's Yang Ming that conveyor belt of Yang Ming is being affected by something else that can be affected by Xiaoyang pathology. It could be you know affected by so many things so if in diagnosis we keep it in in zongfu and don't jump to confirmations from symptoms then we can stay clear right like okay there's some stasis in the large intestine i wonder why we don't jump to yang ming unless we see actual yang ming is the in the shang han lun the opening line is it's the domain of excess. You know, it has to be a really strong excess for it to actually be Yang Ming. And so Yang Ming is very often affected. It's not that often that it's a true Yang Ming pattern. Yeah. Where you actually need to purge it. And there's certainly a lot of false purging, and Zhang Zhongjing warns against it constantly, you know. Like things can look like you need to purge them, but it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. yeah. That 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 quote that I read at the beginning was exactly that. He was ranting and railing against they killed a patient because they kept purging, despite the fact that after purging, things didn't improve, they got worse, but they just insisted on purging. And he was like, they yeah. killed the poor man, and it's ridiculous. Um so that that sounds to me. So then if if you were going to decide that it is a Yang Ming thing. What else would you need to see? So you've got constipation. All you know is there's, there's there's a blockage. You said it could be Yang Ming. It could be dampness at a certain point. And then you're actually kind of talking about a Tai Yin thing. There's a little bit of deficiency. There's a little bit of damp. There's a little bit of whatever. What would make you go from that constipation to saying this is Yang Ming? Yeah, um, it would have to be excess a pure excess. Um, and so through other signs and symptoms, so for example, abdominal diagnosis, I would need to feel that there's an excess, like either the abdomen is really full and dense, or when I press into the large intestine, it is an excess, meaning it really resists pressure, right? Sort of our basics of how do you tell the difference between excess and deficiency it's sort of basic like very full resists pressure you know so I'm thinking of a case of a woman who had 
um, she was very skinny, very yin deficient, very chi deficient, but she um, had a intense pain in her um, left lower abdomen. And when I pressed it, it was very painful, you know, very reactive. And she actually had um, diarrhea, but it was diarrhea due to a blockage. That was young Ming. It was, that was a young Ming on a very deficient person. So it could be confusing, but she needed to be purged. And it, and then it, it had to be so careful, right? Because she's very weak. And so the way that I purged was with other herbs that would help support her. And I remember that case so well, because I, she was terrified of doctors. She was terrified they were going to cut her open. And so I made her promise, like, if you're not better this evening, you will go to the hospital. You know, we'll try this, but you have to promise me you'll go to the hospital because it was like really dangerous situation. So we were, we stayed in close contact, like what's happening now, what's happening now. And, you know, she ended up passing some hard, dark stuff in her abdomen felt better. So it's like, okay, get a good night's sleep. Let's check in tomorrow morning, first thing, make sure. And she ended up being okay. Um, but um, anyway, so that that would be a pure excess. You know, a lot of times it's a pure excess and you can tell because the patient is very robust, very, you know, it's kind of constitutional excess. They tend to get more excess pathologies. So um yeah, so you know, if you're if you're careful and like what is excess? What is deficiency? This is excess, you know. And um I remember her tongue coating was black, which can be either from extreme heat or extreme cold. And I decided it was I had to make a, a decision and I decided it was this young thing which tends to get hot. And so um yeah, I gave her I don't remember exactly, but it was um, a purgative formula with also a lot of herbs to um, help protect her fluids, um, you know, and then worked with her to restore her afterwards. I don't know if I think that answered your question. Oh, that answered it beautifully. I So it's an interesting thing when we were talking to uh, Lori, Lori Ayers in our last conversation, he mentioned that in Germany, they don't use the word confirmation he gave a brilliant one sentence definition of a confirmation uh that was a fun moment uh because we put him on the spot but um he said in germany they don't use the word confirmation they use the word constellation um and yeah. it sounds a little bit like what you're saying you have the symptom but it sits in relationship with a bunch of other signs and symptoms they make a form uh and you need to be able to sort of see that in order to understand what kind of constipation is this? Is it mm -hmm. excess? Is it deficient? Uh, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it dry? Is it damp? Is it, right? So that constipation sits at the center of sort of um, a constellation of other signs and symptoms. That's very interesting. Um, you can never take a symptom out of, out of context and understand it. But then there's the question, how do you find the context? Yeah. You know, and so... Because signs and symptoms are all you have, right? To discover the the context. So it's a bit of a conundrum. And so that's where this sort of method comes of seeing symptoms for what they are and looking at the zong fu and qi blood body fluids that are being affected and then seeing it in yin yang. And then you can start to see the context that the symptom arises within. You know, that's what we're trying to get at. Yeah, it's also, I think, I, there's an interesting kind of almost philosophical point, right, is you you are saying there really is something going on, you just have to see it. Like, I suppose that's where this kind of classics thing comes in, right? Like, there is a way that the universe is working, it really is working like that. There is a way that bodies are working, they really are working like that. And so when they, yeah. so when they get interrupted, you can tell what's getting interrupted, you know? Um, and that's interesting. Okay, um, our, our final question for this session mm -hmm. is, what, um, how do you feel uh, now 
about your practice from when you first started and things were more confusing? Like, it, it really is just a kind of question about your feelings. You know, you started off um, as confused as the rest of us. Um, yeah. It was 40 years well, later. I, yeah. I mean, when I first sort of graduated from school and started practicing, I thought I knew everything. You know, I'm like, great, now I can go practice with all this stuff that I learned. And, um, you know, I think every practitioner feels this, like that you realize like, well, I did what I was told I was supposed to do and it didn't work. Like why, you know, and and you could blame the medicine or you could just blame your understanding of the medicine, you know? And so I think if you blame your understanding of the medicine, then that opens up a lifelong path of deepening your understanding, you know? So why didn't it work? What am I not understanding? And it really led me to see, actually there were huge problems in my education, you know, and the way that Chinese medicine is being presented in modern times, I, there are huge problems with it. Um, you know, that I think are very workable. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I think there's a, it's an interesting balance because I felt so sure of myself and so confident. And then my confidence really waned as I saw like, wow, there's so many things I don't understand. And I would say at this point, there's, much more appreciation of um, mystery and complexity and, um, you know, appreciating, like, there's so much that that all of us don't understand, like, why people get sick and how they get better. And, you know, so there's a, I feel peaceful, I guess, um, because I, I do feel like I have lots of skills that I feel very confident about and and my and it and it's easy you know like people come in I can see what's going on and give the herbs but there's also so much about people's lives and conditions that I'm not in control of you know or that maybe don't even relate to herbs like as an example I have a horse um and he developed asthma or COPD and um, it's been getting worse and worse and worse. And I tried acupuncture. I tried so many different herbal formulas. And he sometimes he'd seem to get better and then it would fail. He was suffering so much. At one point, like we did steroids and inhalers. Nothing, nothing worked. And he was just getting worse. And last fall, he was he was getting really bad early winter. And then um, I came upon a, a website um, called Equine Breathing, just searching like equine COPD. And I found this website. And um, this woman had healed herself through breathing exercise. And she was an equine, you know, she loved horses. And so she applied these breathing exercises to horses. And it turned out, that he was over breathing. I won't go into explaining it all, but I did these exercises with him where only three times a day, I put my hand over one nostril for five minutes, over the other nostril for five minutes. And I did that three times a day. And I have video of his breathing from like the 12th of December where he can barely breathe. He's so struggling to the 29th of December where it's just so much better. Now he's a horse without breathing problems. You know, so and it started me also on an exploration with my patients about whether they're mouth breathing or have open mouths at night and what, you know, so th this is like a whole thing that's like a missing piece, right? How do, how do you breathe? Is it, are you breathing properly? It totally changed the way I breathe for myself. And um, anyway, you know, so 
that's just an example of there's aspects of medicine we just don't understand you know yeah. like ancestral trauma or uh, you know uh, who knows so yeah. you know there there's like i i feel confident about my skills but in the end like like i every patient you just do what you see and you do the best you can and there's things that are out of your control and you can be peaceful about that you know that um you try and it 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 works a lot and it works beautifully, but it also, not everything is in our hands, you know? Um, and it would be sort of arrogant to think any of us have any kind of ultimate understanding and new pieces are constantly falling into place, so. Yeah. Well, this is another one of those points where I'm gonna have to discipline myself to not say anything because I, I just have a lot, a lot that can be said. Um, okay, we're, we're going to call this session before the temptation, uh, the, uh, overwhelms me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I, we, we, every time we have someone on here, we, you know, it's like, we, we're not, we don't, uh, how do I put this delicately? I'm not going to put it delicately. Like we don't make any money from this right and so the nice thing about it is we just get to talk to people that we want to talk to um and so every time i talk to someone i'm just like really blown away by um how much fun it is to learn um so thank, thank you for and we'll see you in the next session yasin did you want to say something before i Stop. No, I I just want to second that and and say thank you, and I really look forward to the next session, um, yeah, because this too. this is this has been a journey. This has been a fascinating journey this past hour and a half. Um, there's so many things I want to go back over. So just simply thank you, and um, I look forward to the next one. Okay. <laughs>